So I'm, I'm very pleased to uh, present our third and final speaker, uh, Chad Jones. Uh, Chad is, uh, is a former VP in charge of Internet of Things strategy at LogMe and Zively. He's also now the CEO of Virtual Potential Advisors. So Chad, take it away. Thank you very much and hello everyone. Uh, really honored actually to follow our, our last two speakers. Uh, pretty amazing though. Uh, unfortunately, David just walked out of the room because I do have one problem with one of David's inventions, the table that says let's balance out the conversation. Yeah, no, that would kind of be flashing red at me the whole time. I wouldn't be able to focus. It would break my concentration as I was constantly talking. So. Some of you know me here, uh, so they can attest to that's probably true. <laughs> anyway, um, so basically uh, my, my career has been built around serial entrepreneurship and focusing on both the angel investing side and taking early stage ideas, bringing it to market. And fortunately, I've been through six acquisitions, uh, including Microsoft, Intel, uh, VMware, all within the last about, uh, what, 12 years. Uh, last acquisition was in August of... 2012. Right, so I've uh, been on kind of an amazing roller coaster ride. Um, it was interesting to hear Colin say that yes, it's a it's a marathon when you do entrepreneurship. I've had two companies that were a year and a quarter and got sold. I think I'm the exception that proves more more the norm, you know, than anything. Uh, but on the Internet of Things front, you know, we jumped into Log Me In and looked at the landscape of the Internet of Things. Said tremendous opportunity. Let's build a platform to accelerate how these things work. So over the last three years, have really had the opportunity to look at some uh, a lot of the deals that were coming in, a lot of the opportunities to really have a business-focused type of product that's coming out and get out into the real world. So based upon that experience, I wanted to talk about some of the entrepreneurial battle stories from the Internet of Things front, right? Things that we've actually seen out there. I'm also going to share in some observations as well because there's a lot of interesting things that we're seeing coming up on the near term and in the, in the relatively near future that present tremendous opportunities for entrepreneurs as well. So I want to share some of those also. So congratulations everyone. We're at the top of the Internet of Things hype cycle. <laughs> Woohoo! We did it! All right! <laughs> Mic drop. We're out. <laughs> <You know. laughs> Of course, hype is fun because we just get to do all this talking, but um, you know, at the end of the day, we've got to build things. We're about to fall down that trough of disillusionment, right? So how do we jump that trough, right? The key is really making things that work and can sell. You know, can actually have solutions to real world problems, right? So the first thing that I really wanted to, to focus on is to look back and say, what is this Internet of Things? Because I don't really believe the Internet of Things is the end-all, be-all. Right? The Internet of Things, to me, is a means to an end in a much larger ecosystem that has to be taken under account to really make effective, viable solutions. So we look back. Look, applications, customers, devices, data analytics, third-party services all exist on the internet, right? But physical objects, by and large, and forget M2M just for a little while, that have really not been part of that ecosystem. The thing that's been in the middle has really been a carbon-based subjective sensor, right? Hi, that's us. We're carbon-based subjective sensors, right? Someone calls in, something goes wrong with their dishwasher, all those types of things. You call in, someone takes, up, takes the phone call, and they kick off a whole series of automated workflows to actually make these things happen, right? Well. Internet of Things is really about taking those physical objects and making them addressable and being able to relate with them. You know, David showed some great ones that he you know, brought on online. But taken together with everything else that's on the internet is actually a way to inform all of the other processes that are out there. Things in Salesforce workflow, for example. An example, some my dishwasher breaking. I don't have to call in anymore. It just phones home and says, hey, something's not right. And it kicks off all of that workflow. All of these things together is what is termed the internet of everything. Now, these are all marketing terms. I hate all of these marketing terms. But when I was, uh, I was partly responsible for product, partly responsible for marketing back at Zively, I could not come up with a better one. So it's hard for me to actually sit here and totally bash it, but I really believe the internet of everything is really where the key lies. So. To us, the Internet of Things is allowing physical objects to be remotely addressable, readable, and controllable over the Internet, but then when combined with other devices, cloud services, analytics, and applications, business and individuals transform how they discover, understand, and interact with their world. It's that combination that will drive that. Um, and of course, we've, we've seen this spectrum, you know, uh, M to M, Internet of Things, whatever you want to call it, it literally affects everything in our world. Um, 
One of the cool things I wanted to show you though is uh, something this company did that thought a little bit differently uh, on how to use this. Now, I'm a big proponent of you know, creative marketing. So being able to leverage the Internet of Things to that is a really interesting thing to me. And this company seemed to do that. And I need to know how to just run the video right from it right away. <laughs> oh, sorry. That's a... Uh... Sorry, my bad, we're extending the screen. <laughs> Which we will now duplicate because that's a pain. <laughs> my apologies, there you go. I know, it was great, and I was so peaceful. Stockholm. They wanted to actually make an immersive experience, something that would make you remember the brand, right? If you spend just a couple extra seconds staring at the brand, it has an effect. So whenever the subway train comes in, it actually affects this. It affects the actual advertising, right? So now people stop and they're like, well, wait a minute, am I interacting with something real or am I not? It becomes immersive, right? So, it's a pretty cool twist it's on actually. It's sort of at the wrong moment though, because then everyone's attention is focused on getting on train rather than. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good point. Hopefully yeah. someone's not like turned around right over the line and like falls backwards or something. It's one step too far at the gap. Mind the gap. Yeah. Uh, sorry, let me close that. There we go. Sorry, bear with me just a moment here. There we go. Okay, there we go. There. So, thinking about how to use these things in different ways is really a cool thing. You know, David, again, just had showed some really interesting ways that we can tie it into our normal worlds. But at the same time, I'm really focused around how do you make businesses out of these things? That's where I, my true passion is. How do you make it go large and make it interesting? Now, some of the considerations that we've run into uh, across you know, a lot of different products that were being built on Zively and in other experiences kind of fall into some of these uh, common areas. The first thing really in building a complete IoT solution, it's not app, cloud, and some object, right? It's really much more than that. Um, I have kind of a theory that says, you know, technology built for technology's sake without first serving, first, or serving a first order business principle is doomed to mediocrity or failure. Right? You've got to actually sit down and start at the very beginning and say, wait a minute, what purpose is this going to serve? What are the use cases? What are the problems that I'm really going to solve? And is this going to solve it in an effective way? Think it again, rethink it again. Go out, test it, talk to people, get all of that input. Work that side first. Now, I'm not saying that you know, running out and starting to build something because you know how to tinker with something is necessarily a bad thing. It leads to great first steps. But without having that well-defined thing create, to create a business, you're gonna start taking that fail first step much quicker than you would if you actually thought it out a little bit longer. Um, I'm a big fan of failing. failing. I, I'll say that. I've failed plenty of times. Fail fast, iterate, pivot, keep going, right? Don't be afraid of that. Um, and then looking at, you know, how do I want to build an actual connected object? What's the infrastructure that I need to associate with that? There's a billion partners out there these days. Zively is one of them. You know, Amazon services, all of them can really help accelerate that. But tying that together, again, to satisfy the business case is really important. Um, and then looking at not just what does the end user application do, but what does the operational side of it do as well? Because a lot of times you can't just put this thing out there and then not manage it. It's going to have firmware updates. It's going to break. How am I actually going to solve that problem? How am I going to track and provision? Security is a big problem. Right? All of these things have to be thought through at the beginning. And then business system integration. So making sure that you can actually integrate these things into the tools that are used to either sell the objects themselves, give us data back on who's using it and why to further marketing, to further the efforts uh, to actually sell those types of things is important as well. You have to integrate it into the things that drive the business as well. If you're creating a business from, from scratch, 
It's a great time. I can tie all of those things together and not be burdened with legacy of, oh, I screwed up a Salesforce instance or I didn't even have it, have one. And people just started downloading like mad and I have no idea who has my product, right? Being able to do that from the get-go allows you to have those controls. Um, and then analytics and automation, being able to look at all of that data that's coming in. You'll have an ocean of data that comes in from this stuff, not just what it's sensing. There's a lot of times, you know, from security and privacy points of view, you're not going to have access to that. You purposely want to keep an arm's length from that. You don't want to see the data. But what you do want to see is how many people have the object, where they're actually located, how often do they provision, from the first purchase to the first time they provisioned it, how long is that. All of that information can tell you things. And then, of course, tying into the automation of these systems, something like a Salesforce automation. Now, if something breaks, Service Cloud just kicks off a ticket, sends it out, and starts that actual workflow to fix these types of devices. Um, and then the end, service and support, making sure that you have that thought through and to end before you put out. Success can be your own enemy, right? Because if all of a sudden I'm like, I've got a great widget, I throw it out there, and all of a sudden I've got 250,000 of them out there, and I found a security bug, and I didn't really think about how I'm going to update those things, that's a really big problem. Right? And now we heard those stories, you know, with the, uh, was the FTC or something, FCC, getting involved um, where you had uh, one of those remote baby monitors, right? And all of a sudden, a uh, guy comes running into his kid's room at 3 a.m. because he hears somebody yelling at his kid, sit, roll over, you know, <laughs> dog commands and stuff. Because somebody hacked it, you know, hacked that device. And all of a sudden, boom, now they're, they're in staring at the kid, you know, just for fun. But it could get far worse than that, right? So... Understanding that government's jumping into this now is a really major concern. So if you don't have these ducks in a row, you know, then when those types of incidents happen, you're not going to be prepared, and it could just kill the business. Right? So these things must be thought of holistically. Um, another observation that we made is a lot of products that are products plus platforms seem to have a lot of traction out there. Now, of course, we all use the Google Nest, right? You know, but it was a great example of a product plus platform. Google, uh, or I'm um, sorry, Nest picked the most common thing that almost every house has in some way, shape, or form that needs an update, but they picked it not just because it would sell a bunch of thermostats. Yes, that's great, learning thermostats is all of that, but this is the gateway into the house. You know, the first hit of crack's free, right? The Nest isn't free, but it's the first hit of crack. Because what this thing will do is come in and do all great learning and all of that sort of stuff, but it creates a gateway, and the platform behind it then allows the next set of products to come in. And now an ecosystem based on a shareable platform is really what is happening. So from there, you now have this ecosystem of different products. You know, we were talking about the locks, I think it was the August locked, all of those things. You know, uh, some of the drop cams now coming in. All of these things can now connect in through Nest's really simple, elegant API to tie these things together. So now I have an ecosystem of things that I just drop into my home and expands. That's why Google Nest, Google bought Nest for $3.2 billion. It's not for an updated thermostat, though it's cool, right? It's because the platform behind it is driving a future ecosystem where now Google can say, hey, develop to us and everything will work together. Because that, inter, that uh, interconnection of those things is a real challenge going forward. The internet of things is really the internet working of things. Right now we're really in a silo of things. Right, so that future has to be done somehow. Why, why is it necessarily the center of that ecosystem, though? Because, I mean, the, the smoke detector is a Wi-Fi device, and could, you could argue that's the center rather than the thermostat. Right. Well, initially, they, that was their first product in. So as that adoption came in, it gave them their first... It's a marketing choice. It's not a technology centralization choice. Sure. It's just, it's just hanging off Wi-Fi like everything else. Correct. Well, that's uh, the gateway is more the gateway not for Wi-Fi, but for the connectivity to other devices that knows how to speak to it, find it, discover it. Wi-Fi too. You don't have to have a Nest in order to have the smoke detector. That is correct. The, the smoke detector could be the, the first you know, uh, punch in if you really wanted to. But it turned out to be that you know, they, their first product to market was the thermostat. So yeah, could you go the, uh, the smoke detector first and then tie on a thermostat later, any of these drop cams and all that sort of stuff? Sure, you could do that. The gateway is more, was more they have got 500,000 of those things out there first and then said, okay, now let's go to the secondary one. It's more marketing choice. Good point. Sorry to tell me. Can, can you address um, uh, uh, 
Misfit Shine's choice to make a light bulb this year at CES? <laughs> you know, I'm not familiar with, with that one, but I've seen other light bulbs like Philips Hue, you know, we go down the line. Um, there's, there are some that are really robust, like Philips Hue, something like that, and there are other ones that are just kind of trying to make the cheaper version of that. I don't know what their motivation is. I still think the price point for those things is pretty low or it's pretty high. You know, um, I don't even have them in my house and I'd love to have them in my house because I want red while I'm watching movies, <laughs> you know, stuff like that. Um, Sorry. Yeah, no, no problem. So uh, the platforms are key. Now, obviously security is a key. I mean, I think we all know this. It's motherhood and apple pie. But the funny thing is the Federal Trade Commission just uh, put out their guidelines. FTC report on Internet of Things urges companies to adopt best practices to adjust consumer privacy and security rules. Thank you, FTC, right? <laughs> so let's look at what the FTC's guidelines are. They're up there on the right. They're in really small print, but build security into devices at the outset. Thank you. Wow, it's the epiphany. You know, I mean, uh, ensure that when outside service providers hire, those providers are capable of maintaining reasonable security. Wow, again, I'm just dropping truth. I mean, these guys, this report should be Harvard Business School material, something like that. <laughs> anyway, the point is that it's not the ridiculous, obvious things that you have here. It's that the FTC is watching now. They have a concerted effort. They believe this is going to be massive. So as, and as, as, as do we all. So the security issues that you're going to see are going to be magnified infinitely. Uh, they were going after the... Uh, uh, like I said earlier, the baby monitoring, right? They're actually taking that as a case. Okay, you know, how many times in enterprise software, a little security issue here, maybe a hack there. I mean, they're not taking it as a federal case. These are becoming federal cases, right? So security from the get-go and showing that is more important than ever. Um, and then, you know, I'd uh, done another lecture at uh, Harvard iLab. I'm actually a visiting practitioner there. If you guys are swing by, I've got office hours. Um, but I did one on the business of the Internet of Things. And a lot of times what we see is that people, again, aren't really thinking about it holistically. And even if they do, they don't think about it from, I'm actually building a business around it. I'm not building just something, just a product. right? So that has to kind of come into play with this. So the way that I run uh, or set up businesses is kind of follows this framework, starting from the bottom up. And once you've got that eureka moment, you've built that prototype, all of those things, I mean, going out, researching all of it, making sure that those product requirements are right, making sure that it's market tested, you know, even if it's just friends, family, those types of things, getting out there and really understanding across the spectrum, is this the right thing? You know, doing that education is important. Um, defining who you're actually selling this to, because who, you know, without knowing who you're selling to, you don't know what their behaviors are, what they really want. You know, so really understanding and defining that is important. And then starting to understand what's the least common denominator of those marketing segments, scenarios. What are their issues? So you can begin to speak to them right, and really resonate with them. It's not about you know, talking to everybody that, you could possi that possibly needs to open their door as they walk in with their phone. right? That's a cool thing. But talking to certain cases that will resonate with that so that those people can go and be your early adopters. And then developing a market-focused roadmap. A lot of people we talk to are just like, I've got great ideas, we're gonna run this way. Like, well, what does the market say? Did you go talk to your market? And they're like, oh, well, you know, they'll just like it, okay? <laughs> um, well, I, as far as I know, there was only Steve Jobs <laughs> who got away with that one, and uh, he was pretty brilliant at that. There may be a few others, but, you know, it's probably pretty good to make sure that you're, you have a market-tested roadmap, right? And making sure people, you're building something people wanna buy. Um, and then go to market planning, really understanding how you're going to go to market, where you go to market, will it resonate in those markets, how do you monetize it, um, and then who are your partners. Partners are really, really key, and I'll show you a map here in a moment, but there are so many things out there that can help you and are out there, yeah, they'll make some money off of it, but, you know, great, Amazon keeps me from having to build all my own infrastructure, that's a fair trade-off, right? So. There's more partners than ever that will help you build something and take out the actual commoditization or the commoditized uh, aspects of something. Zora, amazing for billing, right? Do you want to build your own billing system for something? Hell no, right? Go use something like that. Um, and then being able to do a, a messaging framework, understanding who your target market is and how to actually make messages that resonate with them is really important. A lot of times people just throw it out there, show them the features. Sorry, you can't just put features out. It doesn't work that way. It doesn't resonate with people. You have to have a connective element. 
doing a messaging framework will help that. Uh, and then your marketing campaigns work off your messaging. And of course, funding is always an interesting question, right? So, you know, I deal with a lot of different funds. I've done, what, 42 rounds now, I think. 42 rounds. Kill me. I should have more gray hair. <laughs> you know, I really should. Um, but there's a certain way to go after money and making sure that you bootstrap as much as you can without taking capital is as important as anything. If you can do it on your own, you'll keep more equity and you'll, you won't have a board of directors. That's awesome. <laughs> you know, let me tell you. No offense to board of directors. I sit on boards, you know, all that sort of stuff. But a board of directors is a pain because they kind of do the seagull management, right? I call it the seagull management. So they kind of, you ever see a seagull at the beach, right? And you got some, you know, you got your lunch out and all of a sudden the seagull comes out and it's like, ah, grabs it and it poops on everything and then, ah, you know, flies out. It's the same thing with the board of directors. It's seagull management, right? They kind of like, ah, what is your revenue? Oh, I don't know. Crap on everything. Ah, you know, it's like, same thing. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, uh, side note to that as well. There's, uh, you know, especially with boards, there's boards like to see kind of two offenses, I like to call it. East Coast offense, West Coast offense, right? So, it's football time, right? Go Pats. Here we go. So, East Coast offense. What's your quarterly bookings, right? When are you getting bookings? What's your quarterly bookings? When are you actually coming to catch break even? All of those sorts of things, right? West Coast, how many downloads? I don't care what the money is. How many downloads, right? Because, you know, and, and there's right, they're both right, you know, obviously, but uh, on, on some respects. But, you know, if you think uh, about uh, force equals mass times acceleration, that's right, force equals mass times acceleration. Someone at Harvard, please, thank you. Um, <laughs> yeah, gaining downloads from the West Coast style, gaining that mass, gaining customers, gaining people taking them, right? And then actually being able to sell something, the acceleration of those things together makes you a force in the market. Right, so those, both of those things are important. Getting you out there is really, really important. Um, we won't go into funding. That could be a whole like week-long talk on those things. But again, focus really on what your needs are and take as little as you can without starving yourself. Because right, again, hold on to that equity. Stay in control. You heard Colin talk about that earlier. Right? He didn't want to take a lot of cash because he didn't want to go to a certain point and lose control. That's what happens. Average, uh, I think it's average fourth round um, executive ownership is less than 10%. Less than 10%. Right? So, across all executives? Across all executives. Total executive pool, less than 10%. Wow. Yeah. That's a, that's a fun stat to come into a negotiation thinking and looking at the cap table. Um, let's see here. Next one. Just a smattering of the partners that are out there for Internet of Things. I mean, a ton. And they're growing every single day. That's the beautiful thing about the Internet of Things. Something new is popping up all of the time. You know, I heard a story uh, about a guy in Kentucky. Uh, he had graduated high school, but really tough times living in his mother's basement. You know, literally not in a good way either. Just, you know, want, didn't want to actually, just had to. Um, he went and learned iOS and came up with a really simple application. Picture, put text on it, save it, upload it to Facebook. Right? That's it. That's all it was. The guy, within a year and a half, had $3 million. $3 million from the App Store. Right? Moved out of his mom's basement, thank God, hired a few people, and now he has his own little company and moving on to the next level. I mean, we're at a point in time where Technology is that accessible to people. Can you imagine that just 10 years ago, 15 years ago? It's just not possible, right? But the Internet of Things can allow those types of things to happen. Now, it's not exactly an Internet of Things device, you know, example. But you can go to Radio Shack and grab an Arduino, 20 bucks, 30 bucks, even less, right? All online. Amazing. And what's accessible for you today? Yes, sir. What's, what's the logic for all the 3D printers, the Foreign Lab, Stratasys, Shapeways, for those guys is? Internet of Things is because they're enabling things within the 3D printing, or why is that an Internet of Things? It's a good question. The Internet of Things is being applied to anything that's internet connected now because it's a cool marketing term, <laughs> you know. So, you know, could you end up walking around and, and having some sort of application, you know, body map you or something and print it out, or you know, look at something that you have some sort of uh, you know ailment you need? Like, there's one cool one I saw that mapped uh, like uh, for um, what was it? Uh, part of an artificial hand, actually. So they said, look, instead of having to go and do the whole reboxing, whatever, you can actually get it scanned, and it will AutoCAD it out for you, and then come back and print it for you. Print, uh, you know, an, an additive to your hand. I mean, that's like, that's pretty amazing. Is that Internet of Things? I don't know. Probably not. But, yes? Now, I 
I would say 3D printing is critical if you're creating an object. Mm -hmm. And it's very expensive, you know, to yes. uh, manu to create the prototype. So 3D printing, you know, reduces cost tremendously for any any sort of object or skin around a chip. And so that's where it comes into play. Yeah, it's better than injection molding. That's for sure. You can actually build out a, uh, you know, your own little. But I think fast iteration, fast prototyping, yeah. things that accelerate time to market, all that's great, but it doesn't necessarily mean. It's an internet of yeah, things. Yeah. 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 Like it's, exactly. it's, it's part of the toolkit. It's, like, <laughs> it's, like, it's like sensors convert atoms to bits and 3D printers do the opposite. Yeah, no, I, I, I mean, I'm, I'm sort of conceptually. I just saw a demonstration last night at Bolt with Jennifer Lewis's group here at Harvard, right? So there's embedded circuitry as the printer, so you're creating objects that ha are circuits. Oh, as wow. well, so it's this combination of 3D printing and circuitry. Yeah, well, I see Lewis Labs and things of that nature where you're integrating electronics and other cool things for control mm -hmm. within the 3D printing and that. Mm -hmm. So enough on it. I got it. Oh, okay. so. <laughs> well, you know, it's interesting. It brings up a good point too. You know, what really is an Internet of Things thing? You know, something that uh, is sensorized gives data. You know, maybe one way or bi unidirectional or bidirectional as you move through the world has some sort of purpose so like that. Say, Commercial printing, R.R. R. Donnelly sending a file over the internet from mm -hmm. Chicago to California right. is an internet of thing, and that's been around since 1985. Sure, and, and before internet of things, it was called M to M. You know, and then of course you had, you know, you look back at architectures, and before cloud, there was SOA, and there was DNA, and you know, I would go on the list. I mean, everything just kind of plays back around. But um, so, anyway, so there's a ton of things you can go out and actually leverage to build your solutions. You don't have to build it all by yourself. But I want to introduce you, and I kind of alluded it earlier, to a different kind of thing, right? One that a lot of people uh, overlook. So I want to do the light sensor challenge, all right? This is kind of fun, okay? So we are going to build right now, right, a solution that tells me if the lights are on or they're off, all right? So I'm going to jump on my computer, you know, and uh, start you know, creating a sensor and all of that sort of stuff, you know? Or I could just send you all a tweet, are the lights on in G115, and you could all just send me a tweet back and say yes or no. Oh, it's done. Great, done. You know why? Because people are things in the Internet of Things world. We are the carbon-based objective sensor. Simply asking somebody something is, is an easy way to actually get information. We contribute data to the Internet of Things as well. Now, a great example of this is, you know, first we look at speeding citations, right? Uh, yeah, we end up with just speeding citations in the U.S. in a single year is $6.232 billion industry. Oh, in Massachusetts, number nine. Great. And actually, I've been, been busted enough times on the New Hampshire Corridor 93 getting up to Loon Mountain. I ski a ton, you know. Yeah, I'm going to have to do a Saturday school here soon. Anyway, um, but Waze, right? Waze is amazing. Should I censor up the entire, you know, every place a cop could be to actually see where police presence is? No, that's not going to work. But as people move along a certain roadway, they can sit there and say, hey, I see a cop, I see a hazard, I see a pothole. Because people are sensors too. People are things too. and can contribute that data. Now, of course, the police urge Google to turn off stalking feature on mobile app for drivers. Right, yep, it's all about stalking cops. That's why Waze <laughs> says let's have a little police icon there, right? At $6.232 billion you know, a year for speeding citations? Yeah, I think there's a different motivation there, you know, right? <laughs> Yeah, I think uh, you know they had that work slowdown uh, in New York, New York City, because uh, of the De Blasio thing. We're not going political or anything, but you know, cops kind of slowed down their workforce. It cost. They said it would cost the uh, city of New York for not citing minor violations five hundred and fifty million dollars in revenue. What are those minor violations that's going to cost so much that you feel you have to cite? Is it jaywalking? Really? You know, I mean, what are you making revenue off of? So, anyway, um, but people are things too. And they remember that because it's a powerful thing. You know, you ask complex questions, we can give you simple answers. Data. You know, data is obviously huge. We've all seen some iteration of this, this diagram, right? There are so many things being created. I think it's a, you know, someone correct me if I'm wrong, but it's like the Library of Congress is being uh, written over the internet like every two days now or something like that. And that rate is accelerating. 
I mean, it's amazing how much information is coming in now. Most of it's worthless, you know, with all the food porn hashtag people. But, you know, hey, <laughs> forgive me if you're one of those. You know, I always seem to offend one person in a talk. <laughs> um, anyway, so, I mean, you look at 41,000 photos uploaded every 60 seconds, 1.4 million voice calls, 342,000 tweets, 50 billion messages, you know. The rate that data is, is increasing is unbelievable. But we haven't even seen anything yet. Once the little, little data of the Internet of Things starts cranking out there, I mean, the amount of information that's going to be coming in will dwarf all of that. Now, I like to call it little, little big data, right? Because a constant stream of, it's 72 degrees, here's my device ID and my time date stamp. 74 degrees, you know, here's my time date stamp. You know, every 10 seconds, every 5 seconds, every 30 seconds. All of that adds up. Now, the problem with that is great. I can ingest all of those sorts of things. But database technology is now catching up to finally saying, well, I can do something with those things, right? Stream processing, all of those types of things. But still, we have a massive amount of data that's coming in. Uh, the industrial internet, yes, another term for the internet of things. The industrial internet, that's GE's own term. Um, 1.4 million pieces of medical equipment, 21,500 locomotives, 20,000 jet engines, trillion dollars of hardware, 10 million sensors, 50 million pieces of data. And that's like every minute, something like that. Every minute, right? Crazy. That's going into the Predix cloud, which is their own, uh, their own cloud. Uh, the Double Eagle offshore drilling platform, 256,000 sensors on an oil, drinking plat uh, oil drilling platform, one terabyte of data every single day from each platform. Right? And that doesn't even include the information from worker safety, you know, where I put on, uh, what do you call it, um, you know, kind of a, the wearables that tells you what's my heart rate, blood pressure, all of those types of things so that you can have safety as they're actually working in some pretty harsh conditions, right? It's a ton of data that's coming at us. Now, I also want to play another game with us because I, I, like, I like fun games. This is called Sweet or Not Sweet, right? Sweet or not sweet? I'm originally from Laguna Beach, California. This will explain why I use terms like gnarly and sweet. Um, so, and the hair is like this. Yeah. So, uh, let's say we have a tweet, right? And this tweet's from Temp Jedi, you know, and the tweet is February 14th, 2014. So, Valentine's Day, February 14th. And it says the temperature is 80 degrees Fahrenheit, exclamation point. Great. Is that sweet or is that not sweet? Oh, no, you bet not sweet. Okay, I, I like that. And so, if it's in Florida, sweet, cool. Florida, 80 degrees in February, I'm getting on a plane, I'm getting down there. Well, I like to ski, but still, you know, you have a break, right? It's great. But guess what? If it's in Antarctica, and it's the middle of February, that's probably bad. Not sweet. <laughs> you know, that indicates, you know, a much, much bigger problem, and Al Gore is right. So, what we, what this is important to note here is that, Context is important. Context is important. The same amount of information coming from the same sensor, depending upon the context of that data, has meaning, right? And can tell us a lot more. That's why if we ever look at a Twitter packet, have you, who's looked at a Twitter packet? Anyone actually looked at a Twitter packet? Oh, we got two. All right, cool. That's two more than I usually get. Um, it's not 144 characters. 140 characters? 144? I always forget. Anyway, thereabouts. <laughs> you know, characters. It's all of this information that is around that particular tweet. It's all of the metadata that provides context for what that tweet was provided. And you can actually add in different things and stuff like that. So inside of here, the geolocation of this tweet is important because it's telling me, well, where is it? Is it in Antarctica or is it in Florida? Because one has a very different context than the other. Right? So being able to understand that context is as important as the actual data itself is also something that's important as you build systems. You move them out there because they can tell you a lot. Uh, a company that's actually leveraging that is called Weft.io. Anyone heard of Weft? Pretty cool, another startup in Cambridge. They're crushing it, actually. So I recommend you go check them out. Really cool and great guys, too. CEO's 23 and actually, I think his soul's maybe like 140 the, the way he interacts. The guy's, the guy's pretty good. Um, but what they created was a sensor that will go into shipping containers, you know, nothing too new. But what they've done with the data is they actually know where every plane is in the sky, where every ship is in the world, and this is some public information they have. Every train is uh, out there in the world, and they cross-reference that through their own proprietary analytics system with the information that they get from their particular device in a shipping container. And they can predict port slowdowns. And that effect all the way before the ship even leaves the particular port and while it's in transport as it's going all the way down to the Horn of Africa, all that sort of stuff coming from China, 
and it understands how to slow the ship down so that when it gets to port, if it would normally be backed up for two days, that costs them anywhere from $100,000 to $300,000 a day to have that ship just sitting there waiting to be offloaded of no fault of their own just because the port is busy. Right? So these guys understood how to actually make that happen based on the context of where that cargo is. Just sits there and sends locations and based on everything else, based on the context of where that thing is, it can tell you, hey, slow the ship down. Right? Because you'll get, if you go a few knots slower, you'll get to the port right in time to hit your slot because things were delayed. Um, you can actually see uh, general relativity of uh, locations of these different objects and that can tell you information uh, as well. And then you can track it globally. You know, how many uh, uh, total ship containers are there, how many miles saved, all of those types of things. They have seven figure deals out of the gate on four rounds of debt. That's it. These guys are crushing it. I mean, one to watch for sure. Um, data is also really important as we think about the future, right? I like to call it the interconnected future. Right now, we have silos of things. We talked about that a little bit. You know, the Nest thermostat has its own closed ecosystem. You must write to its API, right? Now, people are writing to it because it's Google. You know, great, you're going to happen. But you have Cisco has a cloud. Zively has a cloud. What happens if I want those things to talk together, right? If I want my locks, my August lock that's on one cloud to be able to talk to, you know, my thermostat or my alarm system or anything like that that's on a completely different cloud, how do I make that happen without having to write all sorts of code, make uh, business development arrangements, all of those types of things. Well, eventually, in the future, uh, you're going to end up having the clouds have to come together in some way. Now, my theory on this, and I'm starting to write a paper on this, is that you need a way to actually create a DNS system for devices. How do I actually bring the clouds together? So that, you know, that vision that we always saw about the internet of things, that we can walk into a room, it knows who I am either directly, expressly, and it puts a policy against me, or it knows just that I'm a, you know, a anonymous uh, bunch of carbon rolling through a room and I will apply a different policy. How does it know that as I roll through, the lights change, temperature change, without all being on the same network? Well, we look back at the internet, right? The internet used to be CompuServe and AOL, and I couldn't send email messages back and forth, you know, and all that sort of stuff, right? It wasn't until the internet came, joined the networks together, you had the routing that brought that together. DNS, you know, came on top of that and made it human readable. And then all of a sudden I could put in yahoo.com and all that goes to the right networks. All those networks still exist today, they're just brought together because of DNS. Well, the same thing's gonna have to happen in the internet of things. If I don't have something that can be a top level service that everyone can buy into because it's not competitive. DNS isn't competitive, right? Everybody buys into it. It's fine because it helps everybody, right? We're going to have to find another service for that that does the same thing. It should tell me enough that if I get into a certain, you know, break, uh, break a certain geofence, you know, I come in here, knows the lights are on. Well, if it knows who I am because we all have our phones, right? That's our digital presence, right? No, you don't really share your phone unless your kid plays your candy crush and kind of screws you up for a while. But anyway, um, <laughs> I digress. But so the, uh, or someone's kid, since I don't have a kid. Um, but so if we don't have a way for you to come in and say, okay, I know who you are, but I'm going to get enough information to say, this is a light that I can present and talk to me in this way. Here's the type of security I use. Now try to log into me or not. Then there's no way we're actually going to be to bridge this type of feature where we get a, a real interconnection of things. Now the example I'd like to use with this is kind of around uh, the medical community, right? So a company that we worked with at Zively uh, is in the connected lab space. It's New England Biolabs. Anyone here New England Biolabs? Yeah, another bootstrap company, totally private, billions and billions. They have their own rainforest at their office. It's bigger than this room. It's crazy. It rains three times a day in it, too. So, you know, we should, we should go into those businesses. You know, I, I want a rainforest. It's kind of fun. Um, but anyway, so what these guys make are little tiny vials of things that essentially cut DNA, glue DNA back together, and can clone DNA, right? And individual vials anywhere from $500 to $1,500, right? I mean, again, tiny little vials, right? So they wanted to create a vending machine for DNA manipulation tools. It's an amazing world we live in when you can have a vending machine for DNA manipulation tools, right? Um, but so we worked with them to have a system that, you know, a vendor will walk up, a scientist will walk up, and they're in Genzyme, something like that, tap their badge, and we'll tell them, okay, I know who you are, open the door, I don't know what I'd like, shut the door, log out. That's interesting data, because the person opened the door, didn't touch anything, because it centered all of that up. Close the door. I don't know, maybe he's confused. 
send an auto email that says, hey, so you opened up the refrigerator, here's how it works. You might be confused, here's what's in there. Hour later, goes back, taps the badge, opens it up, touches protonase line A, protonase line B, great, uh, doesn't buy anything, closes, logs out. Well, that's important too. Maybe he doesn't know that protonase line A or protonase line B, which one I should choose. Auto -gen another, generate another email. Hey, here's what A and B do. Hour later, goes back, taps the badge, opens it up, grabs protonase line A, close it, scans it, completes the purchase. Done. And what do we do? The guy walked up, got something to get his job done, but he was confused. We essentially sent a marketing nurture campaign to that guy, but nobody likes to be marketed to. He doesn't perceive it as marketing because his job is not to buy what's in there. His job is to use that tool to accelerate whatever he is doing, right? So that is just-in-time advice to help him get over a hump without having to talk to anybody, right? And it's seen as something that is empowering. So now that guy goes around. I get all that data. We know what he's used, what the patterns are, all of those types of things, and that helps the company pre-stock certain things, drive their roadmap, all of that sort of stuff. So key information. Other things like quantified self, or you know, which is part of connected life. My homes are getting, our homes are getting uh, you know, wired up. That's interesting information. There's radon detectors that are out there now that will tell you constant radon settings. You know, do I have radon, do I not? You know, that contributes to it. Um, going on, I've fallen and I can't get up. <laughs> you know, all of those things are it's important information. Right? Taking that quantified, uh, that connected life, Bring in the connected caregiver so that if, you know your doctor on average has like six minutes or something like that with you. How would it be, wouldn't it be nice if you could sit there and give them, they had all that information with your electronic medical record that says, well, you know, here's all of my information for the last year that I took in you know, on myself. Oh, great, look at these things. Oh, well, there's a couple areas here I see that over time I have that, that data and I can focus on that and let's go look at where a problem could be. Not, let's just try and guess and see how you've been. How's been your diet? Oh, well, it's been great. Yeah, I know you've been eating Big Macs. You know, it's like, it's that stuff. It gives you real information on that. And that's important because that actually hit some of us lively. Uh, a guy who ended up being you know, really close to the company is our PR guy. A guy named Bill Baker ended up triathlete most of his life, right? He has, uh, he was uh, just walking for something, uh, you know, or went to, uh, was walking for something, had a weird kind of feeling in his chest, went to his doctor. As he walked into his doctor, heart attack, boom. Luckily, he was in his doctor, right? They said if he wasn't there, he would have been gone. This guy's a triathlete, 52 years old. He's been using, you know, all of the different self, uh, you know, diagnostic equipment, heart rate monitors, all this stuff forever. And all that data sits on his PC, completely dead to him. No pun intended. He's alive, by the way. So all of that information would have been helpful probably six months ago to detect the arrhythmia that was in his heart, but the doctor has no access to that. There's no way to get to that information, but it was there, right? Now, he bounced back. He's okay, right? So he's, he's back out actually running triathlons. That's crazy. Um, and I've rethought butter. You know? uh, he's 54, 5% body fat. You know, I'm, I'm going to have to change some things. Anyway, so... Um, Connecting these things together, not only at the caregiver side, could that give me information ahead of time to prevent that from happening, but during a crisis, something as quick as you know, getting him to the right hospital, getting him to the right place, uh, to the right uh, entrance, knowing that the hospital knows everything about him, electronic medical records, and all the other stuff that can give him as much data as possible, and roll that up to see exactly what's going on with this particular patient in crisis, can all come together through this if we're able to bring these together. Now, we're clearly not there yet. Uh, I sit on panels, GE, Cisco, we all agree it's like a 30-year vision before we get to something like this. But this is where the future of things will go. Um, and I won't bore you with all the text, but big data and, an and analytics are joined at the hip. It's not just collect, analyze, and predict. It's also stream process. It has to be that information comes in and is able to be diagnosed in a complex manner and return something sub-second. Right? That is where things have to go. Otherwise, what's the point of making decisions on the fly? Right? So technology is starting to catch up with this. Right? It's getting better. Right? There's a storm and those types of things out there uh, are, are getting there. But we're not there yet. But this is something that database technology will catch up on. But it will be key for the Internet of Things, especially doing it at scale. Now, some fun things we found in power as well that are kind of cool to observe. Um, I think we've all heard of Tesla, right? They just had the crazy videos with insane mode. Everyone see those? They put in insane mode zero to 60 in uh, three seconds, 
Rad. <laughs> you know, I want one of those. <laughs> you know? um, but what they're doing with battery technology is really amazing. Lighter, you know, they have their own uh, battery factory, right? Lighter, better uh, for the environment, all of those types of things. So really stretching that. But for the Internet of Things, there's some interesting technology. Uh, SolidCore makes a bendable battery. So I can put that into a wearable shirt and actually have a battery that conforms to the rest of me, not a big bulky thing that, you know, I can't wear in a shirt. So now the battery becomes just part of the shirt. There's also a company called Thermogenic. Thermogenic is actually doing um, any temperature variants will be able to power a battery. We'll be able to charge a battery. We'll be able to provide power as well. So simply the act of running will generate enough heat, enough power to actually drive whatever devices you have. Um, back, ambient backscatter technology, we already have enough energy in the air for a lot of things. Right? There's radio waves, Wi-Fi signals, on and on and on. Right? Cellular signals, it goes on and on. So University of Washington found a way to actually collect that, that energy without having a battery. So they have uh, that device is kind of clunky up there. There's a company that's actually using this now, but they had two devices, two cards, and with a red and blue light and a little bit of storage. If they got close enough, you push the button, it would transfer the, the bit that turned on the blue light back and forth, right? And have the red lights on so there was power, and it would transfer the blue bit back and forth. So all of a sudden they had a powered charge card without any battery inside of it, just because there's energy in the air, right? It's pretty amazing. And then a company that I'm, uh, full disclosure, that I'm invested in called Ytricity. Anyone heard of Ytricity? Right? Cool, awesome, all right. Yeah, they're really great stuff. They had a great CES. Ytricity uh, uses Tesla's uh, you know, magnetic induction to simply send uh, energy one point to another. It's about this far. Depending upon the coil size, about this far, right? But they actually also created a completely passive repeater that is micro-thin that doubles the distance if I slot it in between. So what I could do with that is I could put the repeater all underneath this floor, all throughout the desks, all on the walls, and put one power or one energizer unit in the corner and power it all. We can walk over it, all of that. I put my cell phone within you know, two feet, it starts charging. It'll charge in my pocket. Laptops charging on, on the desktops. Think about cars, right? When we have, you know, like a Tesla, or we have some sort of you know, electric vehicle. The I-90 corridor goes all the way across the country, right? Pretty cool. But if I'm going to try and take a, uh, you know, a UV across the, uh, the or a um, EV across the, uh, the country, forget it. I'm going to get about 300 miles, maybe 200, maybe 175, depending on how cold it is, you know, if you believe that New York Times report. Well, what if I, every 100 miles, had five miles of the repeater from the Ytricity solution, and my car actually was able to trickle charge? So I get 100 miles. You know, just on its own charge, and then I hit that five miles, and I trickle charge as I go, because I don't have to stop and plug in. Next hundred miles, another five miles. You know, now I put a little gas engine because there's probably spots that won't be. But think about the miles per gallon at that point, trying to go all the way across country. We have a huge transmission problem because the grid is sold in this country. If I wanted to do that and get all the power there, I couldn't. I could do micro wind. I could do solar and put it locally in those desolate spots and charge spots of those grids. So now those things can actually drive cars, and you can get a car on single tank of gas maybe as an alternative, all the way across the country, right? all based on renewable. So these technologies are something to watch as well, but they will also play a role in the Internet of Things. And now we're also moving from wearables to implantables, which scares the hell out of me too. Uh, have you seen that episode, you know, the vice president, uh, his heart rate thing gets hacked in uh, Homeland? Anyone watch Homeland? Yeah, I was like, wow. Cool. <laughs> you know. So implantables are, are interesting, especially when it comes in contact with uh, with Ytricity. Is you know implantable smartphones. I don't know if I want my phone in me. You know, I I, I see. I think I remember. Uh, was it uh, uh, the Dark Knight or something like that? You had the cell phone, and that went really bad. You know, so it's probably better, but it still scares me. Healing chips, cyber pills. Yes, it says Bill Gates' implantable birth control. It does say that. Uh, Bill Gates backed a company where you have implantable birth control, that you have a remote control that says on birth control, off birth control, <laughs> honestly. You know, so I don't know if I want Bill Gates involved with birth control, but hey, it's an interesting idea, but it is an implantable thing, controllable over the Internet. Smart tattoos. Anyone see? Uh, so I'm a big movie guy. I think you're going to get that. Um, you see Out of Time with Justin Timberlake? 
Don't if you haven't, but he had a, a little, uh, <laughs> it's not ready for leading man, sorry. <laughs> you know, supporting? Okay. Uh, Saturday Night Live, fine. But so uh, they had, the whole theory was time was currency. And so you hit a certain, you know, run out of time, literally you die. So they could transfer time back and forth. But he had a, a scale on his arm so that you could actually see how much time you had left running on your arm. Now there's other movies that have done that too. Smart tattoos actually make that a reality. So you can have implantable things underneath your skin that will make that same effect occur. So you can check like your status, green, sweet, you know, that is now possible. Brain computer interface, you know, being able to control things mentally. This exists today. This is not the future. This is actually happening right now. Meltable bio batteries. You know, I have something in my system, a swallowable pill cam, stuff like that eventually just melts away, including the battery. You know, that's an interesting one. Smart dust. Uh, more commonly known as nanites, right? Now, I saw G.I. Joe Rise of Cobra. I mean, if you saw that, come on, G.I. Joe Rise of Cobra, okay? Okay, yeah, that was terrible too. But there was a, there's a scene, they inject the guy's face, a bunch of nanites, and it reconfigures his face to make him look like the president. Sorry to ruin it for you, have not seen it. But, but the same theory is actually working with smart dust. It's nanites that can actually construct their own networks once they're injected and go in, eat cancer, those types of things. That's actually something that is in process right now. Uh, verified self, walk up. I've got you know, enough implantable things that I can scan it and I have my own unique kind of digital fingerprint. Um, implantable 3D smart organs. This comes back to 3D printing, though I don't know if I want to 3D print uh, my liver, but you know, I may need to soon. But the, uh, being able to actually take an organ, print out a, a specific pattern, and then putting stem cells on top of it and having them grow into a particular organ that then can be implanted is something that experiments show can work. I mean, that's the ultimate use of 3D printing, right? So all of these things are, are really coming up, and that's a tooth in the right, you know, and I think, what was that, Total Recall? You know, he has his tooth, he had to pull that out because they're tracking him, and he had to get to his <laughs> It's a <laughs> terrible Arnold, terrible Arnold. All right, so, you know, a lot of these things are kind of, you know, what's going on now, what to look at, and what we've kind of seen. The future is really interesting because I, I follow Ray Kurzweil, you know, and I've seen him talk, I've actually met him, super cool. Um, you know, right now you got Stephen Hawking out there saying artificial intelligence could end mankind, you know. <laughs> I kind of tend to believe that guy, you know. Uh, Bill Gates is worried about the rise of the machine and birth control. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, was it uh, Elon Musk, uh, worth reading Super Intelligent by Bostrom, we need to be super careful with AI, potentially more dangerous than nukes. Okay, but then Kurzweil is like, don't fear AI. He has a different take on it. Now, whether this is going to be you know, something you, you fear or not fear, well, you make your own judgment, but you know, Ray's been pretty right on a lot of things over time, right? Created the first embedded scanner, you know, we all know Kurzweil's history, right? Um, some of his stuff that's, that's come true. But the things that he's predicting now, by late 2010s, glasses will beam images directly into the retina. You seen Google Contact? No, it's a reality. Imagine applying whitricity to that, by the way. You know, that could be on all the time. Um, 10 terabytes of computing power, roughly the same as the human brain, will cost about $1,000. We're not quite there yet. If you look on the bottom, you know, we're about computing power of an insect brain. Great, get to a mouse brain soon. But the acceleration curve on that, we're about to hit the hockey stick with that. Um, gets more interesting, and probably stuff we already know, by 2020s, most diseases will go as way as nanobots, the dust, the smart dust. I don't quite buy that, but We'll see. Normal human eating can be replaced by nanosystems. I like to eat. I would like to continue to eat, actually. Um, you know, but okay. The Turing test begins to be passable. That's interesting, actually. Everyone know what the Turing test is? Right? Okay, being able to interact with the computer freely through speech, that's, and it responds directly with you. That is interesting. You see the imitation game yet? Sick movie. That's great. Yeah. Um, Self-driving cars begin to take over the roads and people will not be allowed to drive. That's kind of minority report, you know, that was up top. Tom Cruise driving from car to car. But we all know the Google car is actually doing that. I, I believe it was Lexus. I'm just going to say it's Lexus, but maybe it's Lexus. Um, actually just demoed that, you know, there's a fourth button that says park the car. You step out of the car, park the car, and the car just goes, finds a parking spot, backs it in all by itself. Right? That's actually on a commercial and, and real today. So we're getting to this point. Now, 2030s and 40s get to be a little sketchier. 
You know, he says, by 2030, is virtual reality will begin to feel 100% real. I can get that with HoloLens and where we're going. Be able to upload our mind consciousness by the end of the decade. If it generates another movie like Transcendence, I hope I am dead by then. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> good God. It's like, what, 18% on Rotten Tomatoes? Horrible. Great idea. Horrible. But he's saying, you know, that's the Johnny Depp picture from it. But he's saying that by, 20, by 2030s, 40s, we should be able to get consciousness imprinted into a digital system. My theory is that, you know, if you look at the MIT Robotics Lab, they started moving more towards analog systems than digital systems. Why? Because analog systems can actually tell shades of gray, right, and make jumps in logic based upon those shades of gray. Digital systems are if then else, if then else, if then else, right? So it'll be interesting to see if we can actually bridge the analog digital nature of our brain into and imprint that into a set of pathways inside of a completely digital system. Clearly, science isn't there yet, but it could be, right? Science fiction leads the way a lot. Nanotech foglets will be able to make food out of thin air and create any object in physical world at whim. That would be really interesting, too. Pizza. <laughs> you know, it's like, pff, sweet. I don't know if I really want that to, to happen, but I mean, I'm not 100% sure how he thinks that will happen, but, you know, we'll see. Um, and then 2040s, non-biological intelligence will be a billion times more capable than biological intelligence. <laughs> Start to see a pattern here, right? Start to see where things are going, right? You know, 2045 will multiply our intelligence a, a billion fold by linking wirelessly from our neocortex to a synthetic neocortex in the cloud. Cool. Oceans of data. This processing power. Yeah, it's the matrix. Again, movie holic. You know, all of these things he's predicting are really coming true. Now you're starting to see the pathways for this to happen and the internet of things and what we've been talking about and what you would need to make something like these things happen, we're at the ground floor of that. This is the direction it's going. I don't think it's fully going matrix, right? No, let's be clear. But there are things in the wireless power, what we would need to actually interface our minds with things, the uh, Google contacts, how we look at our world differently in augmentation. All of those things are at the ground floor right now in what I believe is the 21st century industrial revolution. And it's centered around this concept of the Internet of Things. But you all named it. You know where we're going. You all know where we're going. I like to know where we're going. It's Skynet. It is Skynet. This is obvious. You know. And it might even be that Letterman could have, you know, Terminator on. If they're a cool Terminator, you know, hey, why are you killing everybody? What's, what's the matter? What was your mother, is it mother issues? You know, yeah, anyway. But step back for a second. It's interesting. Uh, that's Putin with his shirt on. That's a rare photo with his shirt on. Um, but that's, uh, that's actually a uh, combat robot that can walk, shoot a gun, ride uh, an ATV. Now, the test wasn't really great. It didn't go that well, but still... It, you know, it's slow. You can just kind of run circles around and laugh and tap it on the head. But it works. It works. Right? That's the first step. Uh, you look at Boston Dynamics and the Atlas up top. That's a real working robot that can walk, run, all of those things. And, of course, you guys have probably seen this as well. Um, there are other uh, uh, canine um, uh, replicant robot, if you will. This thing runs 28.3 miles per hour. 28.3 miles per hour over snow, broken land, all of that. What if you arm that thing? That's real. That is something that could go to field within the next 10 years. Right? So we aren't kind of far off you know, in some of those types of things. You know, it runs, uh, you know, it runs 30 miles an hour? And giraffes actually run 30 miles an hour. That's interesting. Grizzly bears, which freaks the hell out of me because I cannot outrun a grizzly bear then. You know? <laughs> do, you, do, you know runs, uh, do you know it runs 28.7 miles per hour? Or 27.8 miles per hour? Usain Bolt, the fastest man ever. None of us are even remotely near Usain Bolt, so that means a draft will catch us if, you know, if, we, if we ever get into that situation. So just please, word of warning. Um, but these things are real. You know, science fiction is coming around. So questions. Is Cyberdyne Google? Because Google's buying this stuff up. Is James Cameron a prophet? God, I hope not. It's kind of a day. <laughs> but anyway, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm just kidding. Just, just don't sue me. <laughs> okay, just don't sue me. <laughs> anyway. Tesla said it bad. You know, I don't think there's any thrill that can go through the human heart like that felt by the inventor as he sees some creation of the brain unfolding to success. Such emotions make a man or a person forget food, sleep, friends, love, everything. Now, Tesla was a recluse. But we've all felt that moment when something that we've thought of has actually become real and affects change. That strikes at the heart of who we are. Now, hopefully, we don't forget our humanity and everything else and forget to eat, you know, and kind of pass out. But there, there is that connection that we make 
with these things and changing our world. The Internet of Things allows us to do that at an unprecedented level. And you don't have to be you know, a doctor of everything to make that happen. It can be that person that's sitting in his mom's basement in Kentucky that wants a better life for himself. That is our future, and we are all part of that future. So with that, I will take some questions. Thank you. You. I've been watching you. <laughs> so, like in the late 1950s, early 1960s, right? We were on coming out of World War II and on the verge of what would be, you know, the revolution in both digital electronics and call it aerospace space technology, right? In, in the 60s, we put a man on the moon. The Concorde would go, we'd get you from, you know, New York to London in four hours, right? And you know, the SR-71 could go from California to Baltimore in 45 minutes, right? And yet. In the last 50, you know, the 50 years or 40 years after that, for various reasons, economic, societal, or whatever, we're still trying to get back to the moon, and NASA can't tie its shoes. And I say this as a contractor, right? <laughs> it, but but we, we, a lot of those things, you know, for whatever reason, I mean, people have been predicting all kinds of things. Watch the Jetsons, right? And you know, certain things happened, certain things didn't. The internet was never anticipated. But I mean, I, this is all cool to speculate about, but I mean, there's also plenty of historical reason to believe that none of this is going to happen and there'll be a 90 degree turn in 20 years that none of us is looking at. Maybe. No, right? Or, Maybe. Or, or this might just not get developed for whatever reason. Well, a lot of the stuff that I've showed about the future is, you know, part of that's, you know, speculation, you're right. But there, the point is that there are the underpinnings of these things that are coming together in certain areas to make that realistic. The Department of Defense with, you know, the, the dog that can run 28.3 miles an hour, right? You know, that's a real thing, right? They bought, Google bought them for a reason, right? Because that works. You know, Google's buying up robotics companies left and right because they think that can happen. I think that the, the revolution that really has occurred has really been more, you know, there's a lot of revolutions, but the software aspects of things. When you look at what a phone can enable you to do now, actually, you know, your iPhone, I think it's starting with the iPhone 5. It has more power than the Apollo command capsule. Did when it was going to the moon, right? I mean, that's pretty freaking crazy and scary. You know, it makes you look at those astronauts even more and go, "Hey, nice job." Um, but the uh, you know the point is that if you look at the phone, I can take a platform and not you know Apple could have gone and said, "Look, I'm going to close this off." Google could take Android and say, "I'm going to close it off," and I'm going to hire a bunch of developers, and we would have. 8,000 probably, you know, applications, and probably 70% of them would be crap, right? Just kind of how it is. Instead, they opened it up and they put it out to the world and use the collective genius of the world and all of their ideas, all the way from that guy that had a simple idea of putting text on, you know, on a, on a uh, picture, you know, kind of made the fart button. I mean, okay, we started small, right? We started slow. But, you know, all the way up to really complex things that help everyday life. You know, that is really where the collective genius of the plan was able to come together and advance things like never before. So now you have 750,000 apps or something like that. And 70% of them are still crap, but that 30% is a much higher you know, percentage. Yeah, no, but I'm, but saying, like, you know, supersonic transport. I'm just giving an example, right? That mm -hmm. was supposed to take over. You would be able to cross the country you know, in, in an hour or two, and just mm -hmm. for various reasons, it's just economic or whatever, just it's never took off, right? Yeah. So I'm just kind of curious, you know, like that the, there's always this vision of all these great things that's going to happen, but mm -hmm. there have to be obviously some constraints and how much of this. I think constraints end up just presenting themselves as you go through the, the curve of invention, right? Look at what Musk is doing with SpaceX right now. He's trying to land a recoverable vehicle, you know, on, on a thing. Spectacularly fails, but you know. We're also finding it's very, very difficult to achieve the rate of success, say, that the Soyuz program has had used, using 60-year-old rockets, right? It's true, but it's time for things to change. You know, their change will happen on certain things. Now, his, they figure that his, uh, you know, just for that particular instance, his failure was 50% less hydraulic fuel because the only reason in right at landing it ran out of hydraulic fuel so it couldn't, you know, correct itself. So they put 50% more hydraulic fuel on it for the next, uh, fluid on it for the next trip. They think that actually will solve the problem. Imagine if it does. Do you know what that does to the cost of per pound of payload to take into space? It drops it by 10x. This is something that is very, very No, no, let me but tell you. But it's not that no. <laughs> easy to make it actually work, right? I'm just saying that there are lots of great ideas, yeah. and for fail early, fail often doesn't work when you try to put humans in the rocket, right? There's a, there's a true. fundamental sort of limit on reliability that is, it's, it will get solved, but will it get solved at this sort of orders of magnitude decrease in costs and innovation and blah, blah, blah. I'm saying it all sounds very nice when you sit with a bunch mm. of tech entrepreneurs. When you actually put a human in the capsule and they blow up, it's not so simple, right? That's, that's true. true. I, 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 this is 
separate conversation. Yeah, and I, I don't disagree with you. Now, there was just in the space program side, you know, there were people who lost their lives. Chris and wife and Chaffee, Apollo One, you know, we go down to Challenger, we go down the line, right? There are people that have taken the risk to say that this is worth advancing humankind. Now, I'm not saying that you don't put the safety in, you know, all of that sort of stuff, right? And safety is very different now for those things than it was, you know, back then, right? But there's a whole other realm of innovation that can help things that, you know, this stuff will actually help and is already helping. We see increasing today, right? So I think that opening up that innovation because of how the cost points have come down and all that, it's amazing. And supersonic flight, uh, I took the Concorde tour and they were all, they were saying that you know, it's mainly the economics of building something at the time to replace Concorde to fly faster and, uh, you know, faster and sound and all of that, the heat and all of that. They just couldn't do it, make it uh, viable because it would be like $80,000 a person a trip, you know, stuff like that. So. Yes. Yeah, so a little bit of a context switch from the previous question. So uh, given that we're going to be seeing that, or already to some extent seeing uh, thousands of these terabytes a day being generated by the various things, um, what are your thoughts on security and privacy of all this data that's just being pumped into the, the IoT? Yeah, well, it's, it's a really good question, and a lot of people are asking that question, and not nobody really has the answers today because we haven't really matured over social media yet. I mean, how much information do you actually put out on Facebook that you're just not realizing is important and you're giving it away for free? Right? You know, in, we start moving into the Internet of Things space. You know, the Nike Fitbit. You may not care how many steps you take or whatever, but that may be really meaningful to somebody else. What happens if there's a geolocation on top of that? We just don't know today because you don't know really what's in there. You get only a smidgen of that information handed to you when you look at your actual portal. There's a bunch of other information that's going on in the back end. I mean, for those who just saw the Twitter packet for the first time, how many time, you know, how much did you know that all of that information about you sending something like, this is really good pizza, you know, went around with that. All of that information is there. So I think we have to catch up with it, both from a societal standpoint. Yes, government will have to you know, step in at some type of level. You know, I kind of hate to say that. <laughs> I'd rather just have it be free. But you know, there will be a point where privacy standards have to be implemented. And then what happens with that data? You know, HIPAA was a really interesting thing to make sure that our medical data was really secure. I think something like that will have to come into play with a lot of this other information. Now, there's a lot of, you know, EU bodies talking about it. Germany is certainly, you know, talking a lot about because they're huge on privacy, you know, and stuff like that. Um, U.S. is just kind of, bare, FTC is barely looking at it. I think it's kind of buyer beware right now as you consume it. But it's also, if you're building it, it can be an advantage to say, Privacy is yours. We did this at Zively. You know, our first thing that we put into terms of service says the data is yours. We will not look at it. We will not sell it. We will not touch it unless you give us express permission and only for troubleshooting means. And that went a huge way from a competitive advantage because everybody else was saying, I'm going to take the data and sell it. You know, and you're also going to pay me a fee to jump on my platform, right? So I think there's an advantage that you can have there. We just have to be smart at it. You know, about it. From a big picture standpoint, there seems to be in the U.S. at least a chicken and egg thing in that the legal system is really behind, FTC is really behind. But on the other hand, we know that it's a problem. But in order for it for it to be solved, you know, if there is legislation, then then it's required. Then there's going to be a ton of innovation that comes out to mm -hmm. propose systems and platforms and and various things. But so I think that's one of the reasons right. because I mean we can propose this, but who are you going to sell it to if it's not necessary to implement? Why? Why would you impose it on yourself? Sure. Well, I think it's also an informed market will also come back and demand things. Unfortunately, you know we seem to be slowing down on that whole informed market thing. Um, what do you mean by informed market? So if you look at when you actually buy something, right? Do you sit down and understand what is kind of behind it? Not really. Right, you know, it's like you just kind of pick up something and say, "Oh, it does this." I just keep pushing this button. You know, it will do make my life easier. Order food, whatever. But do you really know what's all behind that? People don't take the time because we're just busy. It makes our life easier, all that stuff. That's great. But we don't have the time. We're not sitting there researching what is really going on. If we really knew what was going on in the back of Facebook, do you think we'd be on Facebook? If we truly sat down and understand everything that was going on, maybe, maybe not. But it's not presented in terms of service or a joke. No one reads the terms of service. Why? Because it's purposely built to be this big. Anyone see that South Park with the terms of service? Yeah. That was a gnarly one. <laughs> you know, anyway, kind of fun. <laughs> not saying that's happening, but you know. Yes. Um, going on off of that, uh, to what extent do you think the buyer should have to be aware? I mean, if we take medication, for instance, I'm not expected to have a medical degree. Mm -hmm. Um, but it seems that it almost works like 
have a law degree in order to really understand how technology works. Yes, so, yeah. so to what extent? Certain in terms of service. <laughs> I think it should be somewhere in between. Yeah, it should be somewhere in between. And certainly as we're in this kind of wild west days of where these things go, it should be between us all. Now, you're right, your point about a law degree, not really understanding, you know, having to have a law degree to fully understand it, that's right. I think there should be at least something that says this is the type of data. Maybe it's you know some sort of uh, you know a digital consumer bill of rights that says you must present what data will be shared, right? Something like that. But that, again, that would have to be something that either people sign on together, you know, and bring that out. And there's been other efforts for that. It hasn't really been successful. Um, or you know, you have to take responsibility for what you're looking at because no one else is going to do it for you, right? And so. You know, trying to research as much as you possibly can into something is the only answer I have for right now. But I still, I still think that there is a competitive advantage for people to who really come out and say, "Hey, we went through these strict privacy rules. Here is the data that we're actually going to share." You know, opt out. You know, it's, it's opt out by default. You know, opt in expressly. All of those types of things. I think if people see that and build their products and expressly put that out there, then it's like, wow. That not only will you know people be more informed, they'll start to trust the brand, you know, and then everything that brand does will actually continue to to have that halo effect from that. But again, it's a it's a mix of things right now. Yes. So you mentioned uh, DNS and and the the well, uh, big data <coughs> processing of the signals and predictive analytics. So in a sense, this exists in our bodies, which are Internet of cells. That, sense and compute and, and relay some of the information to the web cloud, which is the brain, mm -hmm. and it then well, further computes and, and controls, coordinates the muscles. So there are companies like Numenta or whole fields like cognitive robotics that try to learn from biology and, mm -hmm. and translate that in, into devices. Where, where do you see... Um, the, the future. Well, I think it's an interesting, it's, it's a really interesting question actually, because someone had said it earlier fog computing, right? So, who's heard of fog computing, right? Okay, so fog computing is uh, Cisco's kind of approach that says, look, all computing doesn't have to happen in the cloud. All computing doesn't have to happen in the actual device itself. You actually have points along the way in which you can actually do some segment, all of it, some of it, none of it, where you can actually, in that chain, have a response come. So if in the biological example is a really good one. Your brain doesn't actually control every muscle that you have. There are functions of muscle memory and reaction. Right, so you can't, you know, if someone all of a sudden came flying out, you know, my it's not really my brain saying, wait, focus, do the, you know, it, there is some to that, but my muscles, you know, I played volleyball most of my life, my muscles to dig something, just it just does it, right? You know, it doesn't have to do this full full chain. So fog computing kind of mirrors that a little bit, right? So I can say, okay, if I want to have a device that's a really really dumb device, you know, because I have power concerns or whatever, but the edge device, the gateway that talks to all those things, can do all of this calculation and get me a response right from there, because you know, Moore's law of computing power is getting really Really small, great, I can have this little gateway that does it right there and then just pump up metadata about the transactions I did, right? Or I can say, look, I have a really smart end device and a really dumb gateway, you know, and then do the same thing. Or I can say, look, I need really powerful comp computation, I'm gonna put that up in the cloud, and I'm gonna send stuff up, and latency may not be an issue, I'm always connected, a higher, uh, low latency network, always connected, boom, have the cloud, do all of the stream processing on something complex, come back and tell me what to do, right? anywhere in between. So I think that that concept is something that, you know, now that Cisco, who controls a ton of the edge, right, is starting to embed in their devices, we're gonna see more and more opportunities for differential levels of function to happen, and more powerful uh, functions in the aggregate because you have so much aggregated computational power in a closer proximity. And I think that changes the game and kind of matches a little bit about what you're, what you're talking about. Cool, there's another one here. So my question is, so, how are, we going to, how are we going to make money with, it, with all this, right? We're not selling products any, there aren't really products in the old fashioned way uh, they were for, for hundreds of years. They're not really, they're like services too, mm -hmm. but they're really kind of a combination of both. Right. And we can do things you couldn't do before, we can make guarantees we couldn't do before. So how is this going to change business models and how are we going to be making money in 20 years. Right. So I think the first thing is that it brings you closer to your customer, 
Right? If you're selling something or you already sell something and you're making it smart, it, it brings you to a much closer relationship with the customer. So in the New England Biolabs example, it's not just here's a vending machine, I get my, you know, uh, my DNA cutting you know, thing. It's I have a one-to-one -one relationship with that doctor. I know which scientists came up and what their behavior is. I know what they touched, what they haven't touched. You know, I, and every scientist that comes in, I know exactly what their patterns are. So then if I learn enough about their patterns, I know, okay, well, they're working on this particular line of using certain lines of protease and all that sort of stuff. Great. They're probably working on HIV-type experiments. Cool. Well, now I've seen him move from this particular line to this particular line. He's probably getting to the end of his experiment chain, right? Let me take that and say, okay, well, he's working on that. Well, let's see what he goes to do next. Does he go back and repeat the cycle? Well, he's just clearly working on whatever that same research is. I can take a roadmap and say, you know, back into my uh, you know, New England Biolabs and say, I'm going to create new protease lines that are specifically around the HIV side to shortcut a lot of these things, and I'm going to market to that guy and say, hey, here's what you know, I have for you and expand my sale. But he doesn't feel again like he's being marketed. He's just like, oh wow, more tools. How do they know that there are more tools for me to do my job better? So I'm closer to that customer. Across multiple scientists, you know, well, what's that research house working on? It's probably 10 areas of research, 20 areas of research, you know, and varies. But you know what those are. So now I can go in and stop, you know, bombarding them with spam for things they're not even interested in and start giving them things that are very targeted to get their research advanced much more quickly. So now that part partnership that's between the, that customer and New England Biolabs becomes very, very tight. It becomes like it's a win-win and they know what I need before I need it. Now, yes, there's a win that I'm going to get more money out of that, I'm going to get more sales, all that sort of stuff, but there's value that they're presenting to them that says, I'm going to accelerate your research and I'm going to stop the waste of spam and all your attention and context switches you know, for focus and all of that. So that gets you much closer. Plus, it's a competitive advantage you know, on top of that because if that freezer ends up going down, then I lose $100,000 worth of stock. But worse, people are eventually going to have other freezers next to it. The guy goes, oh, well, I'm just going to go over to this one. And to try to get back a customer is far more expensive if you ever can than if you didn't. Because then he's like, oh, well, that freezer died. I don't know if they're going to be there when I need them. Right? Monitor that freezer. Oh, it's drawing more power and it's... Uh, you know, ends up uh, the temperature slowly rising. Well, let's get somebody out there before it dies so the stock doesn't go bad and I lose that customer to the freezer next to me, right? So that's, those are ways that existing companies can do it. There's so many new products out there. I mean, Google was, or uh, Nest was making a ton of money before, or great money before Google bought them, right? It's just new products, taking the old and making them new. There are things out there that are, you know, everything can be old, that is old can be new again because you can retrofit things. A pump that's, you know, oh, at the end of its useful life cycle, well, if I'm able to, you know, take out, um, you know, the, the actual uh, open, manual open and uh, close valve and replace it with something that I can remotely control and watch flow and all that and then spin it open, spin it close, that pump has new life, right? I mean, those are all things that you can actually control. So what's old can be new. It sounds like you're saying we're going to be selling more precise tools and more precise points where they will be valuable. But another possibility might be that we're going to be selling outcomes instead. We'll know exactly what outcome you're looking for and be able mm -hmm. to deliver the outcome that you need. Right, that, that can actually be part of it too because the whole data side with the predictive side gets really interesting also. There was a, a case that we saw um, uh, where uh, there's the in uh, the schools, like in one school district, you had you know the union contract that ran the HVAC system or ran the, the heating system and the cooling system, right? And you couldn't go and, and fix it or anything like that. But there's a janitor that actually could touch it. But if there's anything wrong with the system, you had to make a call. It took forever to get there. It's expensive. Eight hundred dollars a truck roll, all that sort of stuff. Well, you know, you've got the 26-year-old teacher goes rolling in and like, wow, it's hot in here. Turns it down to, you know, 72 degrees. And then you got the, you know, 70-year-old teacher that rolls in next period and was like, oh, my God, it's freezing in here. And cr doesn't crank it up to, you know, 75. They crank it to 90 because they're only in there for a certain while. Well, when they're on two different, you know, zones, they're competing against each other, right? You know, you have two separate controls, right? So they'll compete. Well, if you don't know that's happening and the boilers are constantly running on a hotter day or something like that, you have no insight into that sort of stuff, but you got to call the union contract, sixteen hundred bucks to come look at it. You just go, oh, in this room, the two temperatures like this. Instead, a secondary system can be applied to it. 
and say, oh, well, hey, here's a warning. These two are in contention. Let's go in and say, oh, 72, 72, and fix the lock, <laughs> you know, that someone broke to actually, you know, adjust the room temperature. It literally goes on and on and on. But selling outcomes is an interesting one. The data aspects of these things, of how the usage of things is, is, you know, also has money on, associated with it. Some are more valuable than others, but that also comes back to the privacy issue we were talking about. Um, if you can actually opt in somebody to making money on selling their own data, that's interesting. We're not there yet. Data marts haven't really blown up like that, but I think somewhere down the road we will. Um, but I think making products that are just smarter, more intuitive, but also can help understand those outcomes. And you can tailor that in hand with the customer without having to call them and be that sales annoying marketing person. You know, that is where we're going to go. Cool. I think there's more money to be made. Oh, sorry. Right behind. <laughs> No, okay. I, mean, I, then just, I'll, then I'll I, I just wanted to bring up a topic about um, I think a lot of what we've spoken today about with space and finances has a lot to do with generational gaps. So I feel I'd like to hear your words on it, too, because I think a lot of the security concern comes from maybe uh, an older generation where they're not as involved with different UIs or interfaces. We have kids now that are growing up with an iPad with something. So as um, this technology increases, then people are going to be really expected of this is what the product is. This is what it contains. So if you're not building a product that contains this type of connection or mm -hmm. type of functionality, then you might just be kind of missing the game. Um, for the space exploration part, uh, I think the Mars rover is probably a really good uh, example of technology that we've been able to go and not have to put human risk at life. Um, because at what point then do you need to figure out um, the logistics around sending a, basically a sack of meat into space versus a tool that can go and analyze everything and then make assumptions. And then once the technology progresses to that point, we're, we're kind of that. So kind of your ideas on how you think you know, the future with the generations will, will kind of change too. Well, it's, it's actually a really good point. You know, uh, it used to be that my parents would be like, you do banking online? Are you crazy? You know, now it's like, even my mom does banking online. I mean, it's, come on, you know, but you had to go through, to, what, to your point, you had to go through this whole thing where it was secured, you know, that it was proven itself over time, there's legislation around, you know, it got to that point where you feel comfortable because you know that it's matured to that point. Um, the older generation certainly has that, that wariness on it. The newer generation just kind of trusts because we, we understand that. But I think that over time, that's going to still be, once you get burned enough times, and we're starting to see that, the TJ Maxx stuff, the Target stuff, you start to get burned enough times, you're going to start to look a little bit deeper, right? And you're going to have people that, you know, as this generation starts to pass and we have, you know, more my generation starting to come into office, you know, you'll have people that are a lot more tech savvy. I mean, was it McCain said, yeah, I use the Google. Yeah, great, great, man. <laughs> you know, it's like, so, uh, you know, not to besmirch McCain, but that was just kind of like out of touch, right? You know, it's like, come on, yeah. You know? So I think as you have more uh, that switch out in governments to younger people that understand what technology is, possibility and all of that, then you're going to start to see things, I think, accelerate more into, you know, yes, let's deal with these privacy rights, but let's do it a little more intelligently because we've been immersed in this technology. Yeah. You know? um, but with that, I'm going to actually, I'll take, uh, actually. And just suggest um, uh, maybe do one on one session with remaining time. Um, so please join me in thanking uh, Chad. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you.